Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. I apologize for being gone for so long, I had some other stuff going on in my real life, not the least of which including moving into my new location, as you can probably tell from the new backdrop behind me. But I'm all settled in now and ready to get back into the swing of making content. Today's video is going to be something a little bit different. We're going to be doing a reenacting FAQ of sorts. Now, I know what some of you are probably thinking. Chris, you've already done an FAQ. I know, but that video is old, doesn't have great visibility, and also by virtue of the fact that it's so old, a lot of the information in it is now no longer correct. So this is my new and hopefully improved reenacting FAQ, updated for 2021. My intent in making this video is to hopefully clear up some misconceptions that people may have about the hobby, while also hopefully providing some advice to those who may be thinking about getting into it. So let's begin. Probably one of the most frequently asked questions that any reenactor gets, aside from is that a real fire, or aren't you hot in that, is how do you know when you've been hit? And before I answer that, I need people to understand one thing about reenacting, and that is that reenacting is not wargaming. It's not like airsoft or paintball or milsim or anything of the sort. And although a lot of reenactors may treat it as such, that's not really the goal. It's not supposed to be a competition. At the end of the day, it's supposed to be an educational tool so that people can see with their own eyes how a historical battle may have looked, or at least get a general idea of it. In fact, there are some events that we do, like Battle Road, for example, in which we're specifically forbidden from taking hits because the sites are considered to be hallowed ground. Yes, it is fun to participate in these reenactments and to be immersed in a historical time period, but you really can't go into it with the mindset that it's a game. So we don't use paintballs or airsoft guns or projectiles of any kind because first of all, that would be unsafe because the weapons that we are using are real weapons and need to be treated as such. Even though we are only using blank charges, there is still potential for somebody to be seriously hurt if they're used incorrectly. Second of all, when recreating a historical battle, the quote unquote casualties need to be representative of the figures which would have occurred historically. So let's say that hypothetically we were using non-lethal projectiles of some kind and we were doing a recreation of a specific battle, like let's say the Battle of Brandywine, which was historically a British victory during the Revolution. If during this hypothetical reenactment, the Americans got more hits on the British with their non-lethal rounds and therefore won the scenario, that would leave people with a somewhat skewed idea of how the actual battle played out. The one exception to all of this is when we occasionally do private tacticals for reenactors only. In those instances, you might have a referee supervising each group and telling them when to take hits, but in public events, this is not generally done. So to answer the question, how do you know when you've been hit? The answer is, you usually don't. It's generally done on an honor system. If you're reenacting a historical battle and you're approaching the approximate point during said battle when your side historically took a lot of casualties, you might take a hit then. Or your officer might order you to take a hit. There was one event that I did in 2017 where I was in line with a bunch of guys and the rebels in front of us rolled out a cannon. And so the officer said, okay, the three of you on the end of this line go down when they fire that thing. So we did. Sometimes you might find yourself in a situation where it just makes sense and it would look stupid not to take a hit. At Sturbridge Village in 2018, there was one point where we were lined up against a fence opposite a small creek and the rebels were directly in front of us on the other side of the creek and we unloaded maybe five volleys into them and nobody on their side took a hit and nobody on our side was taking a hit either. So I said, you know what? This is stupid. So I took a hit and essentially recused myself of the scenario because it was just getting too silly for my liking. Ultimately, it is up to you when you want to take a hit. If it's a hot day 
and you're tired and you really just need a break, take a hit. Just make sure it's in a shady spot when you do. And don't feel like once you've taken a hit, you need to stay there. You can be walking wounded and rejoin the fight later if you want. But if you do decide to be dead dead, you really gotta commit. I see some people who take a hit and then once the battle moves away from them, they roll onto their side so that they can watch and then they spend the rest of the battle in a paint me like one of your French girls pose. So, so yeah, just, just don't do that. Some people might also be curious about how these events are planned so that the officers of the different units are on the same page and they know how to coordinate when different groups should start taking the most hits. I had a few people ask me if there's a script that we have to follow when we're at these events. And the answer to that question is no, not really. Generally speaking, the way it works is that the officers will all convene ahead of the battle and lay out a rough outline of where each unit should start from and where they need to ultimately end up by the end of the scenario. And that's usually as far as it goes. In my experience, the more you try to script these things, the more they tend to fall apart. So as long as you start in one spot and end up where you're supposed to, you can basically do anything during the course of the battle and most event coordinators will consider that to be good enough. It's all just sort of ad-libbed, if you will. There's a lot more work that goes on behind the scenes at a reenactment in regards to planning out the logistics of things like where people are going to sleep. That's where most event coordinators focus most of their energy. Not so much in the planning of the scenario itself. Backtracking a little bit to the weapons, a lot of people ask, where do you get a musket? And you have a few options available to you as a prospective purchaser of a musket. The first, but not necessarily cheapest option, is to order one from Petersoli, a manufacturer that reproduces a wide range of historical firearms, including British land pattern muskets, but also several models of French, Austrian, and Prussian muskets, as well as things like 1861 Springfields. So they're a good option for multiple reenacting impressions spanning multiple periods and they're pretty much the best quality reproductions that you're going to find. Unfortunately, like with pretty much everything else in the hobby, that kind of quality doesn't come cheap. For a brand new Petersoli produced short land pattern musket, as of the time of this recording, you are looking at spending at least $1,500. And a few years ago, it used to be $1,300. So the price is only going up, it seems. So the better option is to try to get one used, which unfortunately is becoming somewhat harder to do as more people become interested in the hobby. But you can check out some of the reenactor marketplace groups on Facebook, and if that fails, try going to a big event, because sometimes there will be sutlers there selling them. I myself got my musket from a guy named Paul Ackerman of Ackerman Arms. He's based out of New York, I believe, but you'll occasionally find him selling his wares at gun shows or at various places along the reenacting circuit. I should note, my musket, which I bought from him, is not a Petersoli. It was made by a Japanese manufacturer called Moroku, which sadly you can't buy brand new anymore because they're discontinued. Which is a damn shame, really, because one could argue that they perform better than the Petersoli muskets. In fact, there are some reenactors who will swear by this. I got mine for $800, which at the time was on the high end of what you could expect to pay for one of these things, but I'm told now that that is actually on the low end, so the price of these muskets is only going up, it seems. Your best bet is still to try to get one used, but unfortunately it's still not going to be cheap. So don't seriously consider getting one if you're not prepared to put down some big bucks. There are a few websites that sell muskets for relatively cheap prices, starting around 500 bucks, so you might be tempted to get one of those, but I highly advise against this. Let's just say that there's a reason they're so cheap. They're props, basically. Can you fire them? Sure. Do they work very well? No. I used one a few times when I first got into the hobby, and I can safely say it was not very pleasant to shoot. It was very finicky, and plus the wood on the stock was very poor quality, so it would crack and splinter and scratch, and in general it was just not well suited for field use. So my advice, stick to the two manufacturers I mentioned, either Petersoli or Moroku, except no substitute. As a side note, a few people have asked me if you need a license to own a musket. You do not. At least in the US, 
Any model of firearm produced prior to 1899 is considered a relic and therefore does not require a license. So even though the muskets that we use for Rev War reenacting are reproductions, since the originals that they are based off are from before 1899, they still don't require a license. That being said, you do still have to be smart with them. I still wouldn't just go carrying one around in public whilst out of uniform, because although they don't require a license, you can't expect that the average person is going to know that, and you could still potentially be setting yourself up to be in a bad situation. Again, remember that these are not toys, they are real weapons, and therefore you still need to treat them with as much respect as you would treat any other firearm. Speaking of uniforms, that leads me into the next question I'm often asked, which is, how do you get your uniform? And there really isn't a straightforward answer I can give to that question, because where you get your uniform really, really depends on what your impression is and what period you are hoping to portray. There really isn't a one-stop shop for all of your reenacting needs, and even if there was one, I'd be wary of it because there's a good chance that the quality of the items would be pretty dubious. For some time periods, like World War II or World War I, you can get away with ordering from these sites, like Soldier of Fortune or What Price Glory, both of which make uniforms that range from good to okay, but if you really want a uniform that is tailored specifically for you, which you will need, especially if you're doing 18th century, you really have to get it custom made. Do not order from Townsend's. They're a great YouTube channel with lots of really interesting and informative stuff, but their clothing line is nowhere near up to par for pretty much any reenacting group that's worth a damn. And another thing that I cannot stress enough is this. Don't order anything until you've joined a group first and you know what their authenticity standards are. Don't run the risk of buying a bunch of stuff that turns out to be useless. A lot of groups, especially the more authentic ones, make all of their stuff in-house and will either have their own regimental tailor who makes everything for you, or they might encourage you to make everything yourself. There are quite a few makers in the hobby who will be happy to construct a coat for you. For example, you have Carl Iverson of Line of March, you have Ian of Royal Blue Traders, whom I've mentioned before on this channel, you have the Progressive Tailor, as well as several other big names in the hobby, but their services are in pretty high demand, so if you want to be outfitted fairly quickly, the fastest way to do it is honestly probably just to learn how to do it yourself. Many regiments will offer sewing workshops to teach you the ropes if you don't already know how to sew. The other added benefit of assembling the kit yourself is that you cut down on the price of labor, since at that point you are only paying for the materials. But those materials are still not cheap. Again, I must stress that assembling a kit is a serious investment of both time and money. Don't make the mistake of buying cheap and trying to cut corners thinking that nobody will be the wiser, because trust me, everyone will know. And like, immediately. And again, I should stress that the exact price of your kit will vary depending on what exact impression you're planning to do. But don't be surprised if you spend something in the ballpark of $2,000 for your first kit. The basic uniform for a Rev War impression will probably cost you something in the ballpark of $600 to $700. So that's for the hat, neck stock, shirt, waistcoat, coat, breeches, stockings, and the leather gear. The most expensive item probably being the coat. But that doesn't include shoes. Shoes in particular can be quite hard to come by because there aren't very many makers in the hobby currently which are producing good quality 18th century shoes. So you may want to save those for last, but when you finally do get around to purchasing them, they'll probably run you somewhere in the ballpark of $150 to $200. And then on top of all of that, you still have to get the musket, which, as I mentioned before, can run you anywhere from $800 to $1,500 all by itself, depending on where you get it from. So, yeah. Assembling an impression can seem like a very daunting task just because of all of the money you have to spend up front. But once you do put down those initial payments, you're not spending very much money otherwise, except for yearly membership dues, gas, and occasional kit maintenance. But that's basically it. So with all this talk of joining units, how do you actually go about doing that? This is a question that I've answered before in a video with Brandon F, which you can find on his channel, but I'll repeat it here because I think that this is still the best advice I could possibly give on the subject. Your best bet for finding a unit is to go to a reenactment and ask the units that are there. Treat it like a job fair. Approach each one and ask them what they're all about. Talk to the members, try to figure out which one seems like the best fit for you. 
Uh, if you're not sure where there might be events in your area, check Facebook. Look up historic sites or museums or parks in your area. See if you can get a sense of what units are going to be attending the event in advance. Most units these days are pretty active on social media, so it also doesn't hurt to shoot them a message there as well. Now, there are a few caveats, the first of which is that there is a minimum age requirement. If you're hoping to get involved in the hobby as a musket man, you have to be at least 16 which I know is probably not what a lot of people want to hear. I've had a few people come up to me and go, I'm 14 and I want to get involved in the hobby as a musket man. Well, wait a few years and then come back. The hobby will still be here, trust me. But for insurance purposes, you have to be at least 16. If you can drive your own car, that also helps. It's not a requirement because reenactors do carpool quite frequently, but in most cases, it's easier to drive yourself, at least if you're going to a local event. If it's an event that's very far away, like six hours away, for instance, then definitely carpool, but be prepared to at least drive yourself part way to a rendezvous point. Any of the big regional events are most likely going to be a substantial distance away from you. Also, when it comes to finding groups in your area, just be aware that depending on what impression you're hoping to do, you may not always find a group that is close to you. If you're on the East Coast, you can generally find Rev War units in any state, but you may not have as much luck with other time periods. So if you need help finding a Rev War unit to join, chances are I can probably point you in the right direction no matter what state you're in, but just be aware that I'm not a search engine and I don't know every group that is out there. So if you ask me something like, what World War II groups are available in Southern Florida? I can't help you there, sorry. Another common question I get is, can women slash minorities still reenact? And the answer to that question is yes. A thousand times yes. People of different races, ethnicities, religions, genders can absolutely all still reenact, and it's kind of a shame that this question even has to be asked. It's true that the hobby tends to be primarily comprised of generally older white men, but I don't think that's intentional. It just so happens that white men have had it pretty easy compared to virtually everyone else in the past 400 odd years or so, and they're more likely to have fewer reservations about wanting to recreate the past. But history is a lot more diverse than people realize, and if you dig deep enough, you can usually find references to different ethnicities and races serving in virtually any early modern conflict in at least some capacity. And the same goes for having women in the ranks. A lot of reenactors get really bent out of shape about women portraying soldiers. I personally have never had an issue with it. I know that some organizations within the hobby have very strict rules about it, but my personal opinion is that anybody who wants to experience what it was like to be in the shoes of an 18th century soldier should be allowed to do so, regardless of their identity, even if it's just for a short time. Again, just be prepared for people to ask you about why you're doing it, and take the time to do your research so that you can inform these people about the role that women would have actually have had in the army historically. I will say this though, portraying an 18th century soldier does have its moments, but it's certainly not without its drawbacks and can be quite frustrating at times. And I think that in general, the hobby is severely lacking people who are willing to portray non-military impressions. So if you're a woman thinking of getting involved with the hobby and you want to do so as a soldier, that's fine. But if you want to be a camp follower, all the more power to you. There's almost a stigma towards people who do non-military impressions in the hobby, which is weird in and of itself because the majority of people who do military impressions in the hobby, myself included, have no actual real life military experience. I think it's because doing civilian is somehow perceived as easier, but that's honestly not true. Doing civilian is hard because look at it this way. Regimental variations notwithstanding, when you're doing a military impression, everyone is essentially wearing the same thing because you have a document somewhere that dictates exactly what the uniform should consist of. So all you need to do in order to recreate a military impression is to just follow that document. But when you're doing civilian, you don't have that option. And so you need to have a much greater understanding and appreciation of the material culture of the period. And there are all sorts of different factors to consider regarding the background of the person you're portraying. Like, what is their trade? How much money do they make? What materials can they afford? And what is the fashion in the exact place that they are from? 
at the exact time that you are portraying them. These are questions that you do not necessarily need to know if you are doing a military impression, but they can make or break a civilian impression. So if you're a woman thinking of getting involved in the hobby, I strongly encourage you to do so as civilian because God knows we need more of them, especially if we want to give people the full historical perspective. All right, I think I've prattled on long enough here, and I feel like I've hit most of the major points that I wanted to hit, so I do hope at least some of you found this informative or interesting. If you did, as always, leave a like and a comment down below, let me know, subscribe if you haven't done so already, and as always, God save the king.